My father uh, was, or he still is, he's, he's a pastor back in Florida, and so he's still pastoring a church there. And so my brother and I, uh, being good pastor's kids, uh, I remember growing up, during the weekdays, my father and mother would be out most nights. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they would be out most nights, whether it's Bible study, prayer meeting, uh, going to visitations. And so when they left, or before they left, they would tell my brother, while we're gone, uh, do your homework, practice your instruments. Uh, if you're done with that, uh, go ahead, clean the house, do the dishes, do the laundry, uh, vacuum, a uh, whole list of things that we can never accomplish in one night. And so sure enough, when my parents left, we would hear the garage door open and close. And as soon as we were sure that they were gone, my brother and I would rush immediately either to the television or to our computers. And so once they left, we would turn on the TV, watch the television shows we wanted to watch, or we would go turn on the computers and play video games. We would play for all night until, until they came home. And we knew that they were coming home because we could hear the garage door open and rumble. So we would play, and as soon as we heard, as soon as we felt the garage door open and rumble, that loud brrrr, my brother and I, we would jump up, turn off the TV, turn off our computers, rush to our desks, start doing homework, rush to the piano, start playing piano as if we had been doing it all night. Before my parents left, they commissioned us. They gave us a task. Do all these things. But while my parents were gone, we went off and did other things. And it wasn't until we heard the garage door, the loud rumble, brrr, the sign that they're coming back, it wasn't until then that we rushed back to do what we were actually supposed to do. Even to this day, uh, I've conditioned myself growing up traumatize myself to the sound of garage doors. Even to this day, if I'm home watching TV and I hear Nelly come home, so if I'm watching TV and I hear the garage door open, uh, I'll turn off the TV and run uh, to the piano that's not home, right? Are you waiting until you hear the garage door? Are you waiting for a sign a symbol? Are you waiting for a noise, the next milestone, before you get back to doing what you were commissioned to do? Before Christ ascended to heaven, he commissioned his disciples, make disciples of all nations by going, by baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, by teaching them all to obey all that he has commanded. And while Christ has gone, he has commissioned us with this task. But the question is, are we fulfilling the great commission before he returns? We read in the scriptures, in Acts and Revelation, that when Christ returns, it's going to be loud. It's going to be noisy. It's going to be obvious. It's going to be bright. Flashes of lightning, sounds of trumpets. We're going to know when Christ returns. So are we just going about our business, doing the things that Christ has not commissioned us to do, thinking, whoa, I'm going to wait for the trumpets to sound. I'm going to wait for the garage door to open. Then I'm going to scurry back to do what I was supposed to do. Are you, am I, are we waiting for the garage door? Are we waiting for that sign, for that next milestone before we run back to fulfill the great commission? This morning, we're going to tackle this issue that we are not to wait until later, to not wait until tomorrow, to not wait until Christ's return to get serious about our faith. That we are to get serious about our faith through a continual and constant process here and now. In order for us to be serious about our faith, we'll see three constants this morning. To be serious about our faith, to follow Jesus here and now, we need to be constant, constant in our diligence. Secondly, we need to be constant in our surrender. And third, we need to be constant in our fear of the Lord so that we do not delay to wait until later to be serious about our faith. Be constant in your diligence, be constant in your surrender, and be constant in your fear of the Lord. This morning, our text comes from Luke chapter 17. We'll be in verses 20 through 37. Luke 17, picking up where we left off last week, 
will be in verses 20 through 37. Are you waiting for the garage door to open? Or are you ready to be constant in your faith? Luke 17, 20 through 37. Again, you can find Luke in the New Testament towards the right-hand side of your Bibles. Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you see John, Acts, Romans, any of the first or seconds, Revelation, you've gone too far. As we proceed through Luke, picking up where we left off last week, we see here Jesus is continuing to travel with his disciples. He's been teaching in northern Israel. He makes his way down through the areas of Galilee and Samaria, making his way closer to the center, to Jerusalem, the capital. Jesus is just a short time away from his triumphal entry in chapter 19 to Jerusalem. In chapter 19, he's a week out from his crucifixion. Verse, chapters 20, 21, 22, and on detail his death, his resurrection, and his ascension to heaven. As he winds down his earthly ministry at the end of chapter 17, he continues to teach his disciples, continues to warn the crowds and the Pharisees. As he continues to teach and to warn, here in 20 to 37, he heeds and warns them to not delay in their faith. Let's look verses 20 through 21. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look here, it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. The Pharisees, these religious leaders, they're asking, when is the kingdom of God coming? When is heaven on earth? When is God's kingdom and sovereignty to be fulfilled here and now? There was this great belief by the Jews and the religious leaders that the coming of God's kingdom would come with great signs and miracles and wonders. But what is Jesus' response? He tells them, no. The kingdom of God is not coming ways you can observe in signs and miracles and wonders. People won't be able to say, look, here it is or there. But instead, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. The Pharisees are asking Jesus. We've studied the law and the prophets. We have all this knowledge. We know all about God. When is the kingdom of God coming? We have all this knowledge when are we going to apply it? When are we going to follow the Messiah? When is the kingdom here? When can we act on our faith? Jesus is telling them the kingdom of God is already in your midst. He's telling them you don't have to wait until later, but you can follow the Messiah. You can follow Jesus right then and there. You can experience the kingdom by following Jesus here and now. Going on, 22 through 25. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will look and not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So in 20 through 21, Jesus tells the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is already in your midst. It's not going to be in ways you can observe. But then he follows to turn to his disciples. And then in 22 through 25, he tells them, oh, Actually, the kingdom of heaven will be observed. People are going to wonder where it is. The Son of Man will first suffer and die, and then what? He will come back, but first, there will be lightning. So why is Jesus, on one hand, telling the Pharisees, the kingdom of heaven is already here in ways you cannot observe, but then he tells the disciples the kingdom of heaven is yet to come in ways you can observe? What Jesus is describing here is the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, heaven on earth, God's sovereignty, heaven fully fulfilled. But he's describing this in a way we can describe it as already and not yet. 
God's kingdom is already, but at the same time, not yet. When can they experience God's sovereignty? When can they experience redemption and restoration, forgiveness of sins? When can they experience holy communion with God and with his people? When can they follow Jesus? They don't have to wait until later. Already, they can experience a small piece of heaven here and now. They can already experience a shadow and foreshadowing of heaven here and now. By the same time, the kingdom of God is not yet. It is not yet fully fulfilled or revealed in its fullest manifestation until Christ returns. We are not yet made perfect and whole in him. Not yet. However, already here and now, we can and must follow Jesus. The Pharisees and perhaps the disciples as well. When is the kingdom of heaven coming? We know all these things that we've been taught about the Messiah. When should we follow Jesus? Later? No. The kingdom of God is already in our midst. We can follow him now. When should you get serious about your faith? Tomorrow, the next day, later, when the garage door opens, when you feel that rumble, when you see lightning and signs, do it then? No. Do not delay. Do it here and now. Verses 26 through 30. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. 28. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Why not delay? Why not wait until you hear the trumpets, you see the lightning? Why not wait until the last second to get serious about your faith? Jesus gave two specific examples Because if we wait to get serious about our faith, if we wait for the trumpets and lightning to sound and to be seen, it will be too late. He gives two specific examples. Noah, he was building that ark. He was warning the people decades upon decades upon decades. It took him a long time to build that ark. But what were the people doing? They were eating, drinking, Marrying and giving others to marriage. They were going about their busy lives, doing their regular things. But when the rain started pouring, when they started to see the signs, when it finally clicked, oh, wait, 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 this is real. It's time to get serious. Let us in the ark. It was too late. The scriptures detail the wickedness and the sinfulness and disobedience of Sodom and Gomorrah. The people... They were eating and drinking, being merry, marrying and giving those and others to marriage. But when they saw fire and sulfur raining from heaven, oh, wait, 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 it's serious. I need to get serious about repenting and turning to God. They waited, and it was too late. Don't delay. Do not continue to wait. Do not put off getting serious about your faith. Be constant and continual in your diligence. Uh, This past week, a little update, I I went to my first physical therapy session, uh, and the physical therapist, uh, the the doctor, the surgeon, told me, uh, give it seven to eight months post-op. So I had surgery April 3rd, uh, 2019. Uh, The doctor said, hey, seven, eight months uh, until contact sports, until you play basketball again. So that marked it around December. I went to the physical therapist. The physical therapist said, uh, good luck with that. Uh, You should wait a whole year. Okay, that's fine. I'm not in a rush. So I marked out my calendar. I got surgery April 3rd, 2019. The physical therapist said, 
you can go back to basketball, you can go back to physical contact sports, April 3rd, 2020. So what if? Now I have a date. I know when the end is coming. I know when contact sports, when physical therapists, when is the kingdom of contact sports coming? Physical therapists told me the kingdom of contact sports is coming April 3rd, 2020. Got it. I know when the kingdom is coming. So what if? What if I said, since I have a date, since I know when I can play contact sports, since I have a date in place, until then, I'm going to go back to my wheelchair. I'm going to let my leg, legs, my body atrophy for a whole year. I'm not going to do any exercises. I'm not going to be constant in working out. And so I'm going to just roll around in my wheelchair. I'm going to lay in bed for a whole year. I'm going to go to bed on April 2nd. 2020. I'm going to wake up April 3rd, 2020. I'm going to come here, invite you all, and we're going to play some basketball. So I'm going to roll up in my wheelchair. I'm going to take off my brace, and I'm going to get up, and what? And fall flat on my face. Just because I marked a date what makes me think I can wait and let my muscles atrophy and think I'm just going to wake up on that marked date and do what I said I was going to do? When are you, when am I going to get serious about our faith? Oh, I know. When I start high school, I'll get serious about my faith. When is the kingdom of God coming? I've marked it. The first day of high school, I'm going to get serious about my faith. So what you're saying is, throughout middle school, you're going to let your faith atrophy and weaken. You're going to go to bed the day before school starts. And you're going to wake up the day high school begins. You're going to get out of your wheelchair. You're going to get out of your bed. And you're going to say, hey, I'm going to be bo oh. Well, high school's scary. It's busy. In fact, I'm going to wait. I'm going to... I won't kick it down the road. In college, I'll get serious about my faith. So you're going to let middle school and high school years atrophy. What makes you think the first year on campus, the first day you're going to wake up, whoa, I'm still too weak. Okay, I want to get a job. I want to get married when I have kids. When I settle down, when I retire, then I'll get serious about my faith. To keep saying we're going to get serious later, it's just the lie we're telling ourselves. We must be constant, progressing day by day and growing and maturing gradually and not waiting for some day, some sign to just hop up and say, aha, then now I will start. If your commitment is to follow Jesus later, a commitment to follow Jesus later is, in fact, not a commitment to follow Jesus at all. It'd be like if I came here and said, hey, guys, good news. I've decided, January 1st, 2020, I've decided, good news, let's celebrate this. January 2020, I'm going to finally be faithful to my wife. Right? High five all around, right? How many of you would say, that's awesome. That's awesome. You're going to be faithful to your wife in 2020. If I told you my commitment is this, I'm going to start being faithful to my wife in 2020, that's not a vow of commitment. What you should be hearing is, wait, wait, wait. So you're saying you've committed to be unfaithful to your wife for 2019. I'm going to get serious about my faith. Next year, I'm going to get serious about my faith when I settle down. I'm going to get serious about my faith later. That is not a statement of commitment, but that is a statement of unfaithfulness now. God, I will surrender my idols later, meaning, God, I'm going to keep worshiping my idols now. 
perhaps for some of you this morning, you've made a non-commitment about later. Let us not celebrate how you've resolved to follow Jesus later. But may you realize our unfaithfulness and our commitment to cheat on God now. The Pharisees asked Jesus, when is the kingdom of God coming? When do we follow the Messiah? Jesus' response, don't wait till later. Do it now. If your plan is to kick your faithfulness to God down the road, my prayer and my encouragement to you this morning is to not wait until later. It's too late. Begin each and every day here and now. Is there a devotional? Is there a Bible reading plan that you're waiting to do later? Don't wait till later. Do it now. Are you waiting to get into community with believers later? Don't wait until later. Do it now. Are you waiting to serve and to wait until later to get involved with PCAC ministry? Don't wait until later. Get involved now. As we strive to be constant in our diligence to the Lord, we must realize as we grow, we must be constant in our surrender to him. Moving on, let's look at 31 through 33. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. 32, remember Lot's wife. Jesus is talking about as we follow Jesus, we are not to turn back to the things of this world. That as we follow Jesus, we must give up and surrender the things of this world. The hopes and dreams and our aspirations to build our own kingdom don't look back, but continue to follow Jesus. Luke 17, 32 you can add this to the good list of verses to, to memorize, uh, along with classics like John 15, 30, 11, 35, Jesus wept. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, 16, uh, rejoice always. That's the easy one. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually. Uh, Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. Man, you've, you've got four, you, four verses right there, right? It makes John 3, 16 sound like a whole book, all right? Remember Lot's wife. Why? As fire and sulfur were raining down Sodom and Gomorrah, God plucked Lot and his family out. But he warned them, as you flee from the city, as you flee from sin and unrighteousness, as you flee from the things of this world, as you flee from the past, do not turn around. Keep going. Lot's, Lot's wife turns around and turns into a pillar of salt. Following Jesus must be a continual and constant surrender to not look back. Going on. 33, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. If we strive to follow Jesus, but at the same time strive to hang on to all our things, all our possessions, all the earthly things, our desires, we will lose our lives. If we surrender those things, then we will have life eternal. We've mentioned this illustration before, but I think it captures it well. This idea of monkey trappers in Asia coming up with this great way to catch monkeys. I don't know what they do with the monkeys after, uh, but if you ever want to catch a monkey, you can try this, right? So what these monkey trappers will do is they'll grab a coconut, and they'll take that coconut and they'll attach it to a chain. And they'll take that chain and they'll attach it to a tree or put it in a stake in the ground. In other words, they'll make sure that that coconut is immobilized. It's not going to go anywhere. And they'll take that coconut and they'll cut a small hole in that coconut. And inside the coconut, 
they're going to put all these wonderful, delicious, and great things that the monkey wants. Berries, fruit, and they'll put it all up in that coconut. So what will happen? The monkey, here's George, he'll come up to the coconut. He'll see all these treasures that he wants. And the monkey will reach in to grab it. The trappers, they cut the hole in the coconut just small enough for the monkey to reach its hand in. But what happens? Once the monkey grabs a handful of the berries and fruit, the monkey is now stuck. The monkey is now attached to the berries and the fruit, attached to the coconut, attached to the chain, attached to the tree. The monkey is not going anywhere. Yanking, screaming, screeching, trying to get free, trying to save its own life. The trappers come and trap and take the monkey. What did the monkey need to do to get free? Let go of the fruits and berries. Let go of the treasure and get out. Verse 30. Three, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. What is killing you and me? What is trapping us in sin and unrighteousness? What is hindering and distracting us from full-fledged following Jesus is this tendency to keep holding on to the things of this world. If you're waiting until later to follow Jesus, may the Holy Spirit convict you, perhaps you're waiting until later because you're not yet done holding on to fruits and berries. The treasures, the idols, the dreams, the aspirations, your own name, your own kingdom here on this earth. I'm not ready or have time to follow Jesus because my GPA, my standing, my face, I have to keep it. But do we realize that's what's trapping and killing us? I'm not ready to follow Jesus well, because I don't have time. I've got dreams and aspirations. I'm building my kingdom, my home, my career. Perhaps that's what we need to let go of. And we need to realize that's what's killing us and trapping us. May we find freedom in surrendering the things of this earth and following full heartedly. Don't wait until later. Follow Jesus now by being constant and consistent. Kicking it down the road is not a commitment to Jesus, but a commitment of unfaithfulness now. Follow Jesus by not waiting until later. Perhaps it is because you are still hanging on to things of this world. What is it that you need to let go of here and now? As you grow and mature, may the Holy Spirit reveal to you day by day more and more what are more things that you need to surrender in order to follow him. Lastly, follow Jesus here and now by being constant in fear. 33, if that's not fearful enough, remember Lot's wife. 34 through 37. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Being taken Jesus is describing, taken where? Taken to judgment. Jesus is describing there will be a separation among people. The goat from the sheaf, the wheat from the chaff, the righteous from the unrighteous, those in Christ from those not in Christ. There will be a great and real judgment to come, an accounting of our lives, a judgment the unrighteous unto death and eternal punishment in hell under God's wrath. For the righteous, a judgment unto life and life eternal. 37, 
And they said to him, the disciples asked Jesus, where will this judgment occur? Jesus' response is quite ominous. Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. The judgment will be so widespread, sin and death will be clearly laid out. You won't need to ask where. You'll be able to see it. Sometimes early in the week or maybe late in the week, uh, and oftentimes Nelly will ask me, hey, uh, what are you going to be preaching on this Sunday? And uh, in the event I don't know yet or I'm not sure or I can't quite articulate what the sermon will be about, uh, I'll go to my default answer, uh, which she doesn't really appreciate. Uh, So if I'm not ready and she asks me, hey, what are you going to preach about? Uh, I'll give her my pseudo uh, hellfire brimstone uh, synopsis. So, uh, so if, if I'm at the, the table, uh, she says, hey, what are you going to preach about today? Or, or preach about Sunday. Uh, I'll tell her, uh, you, know, um, you know, repent, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, right? Hallelujah, all right? Uh, so far, far be it, far be it from me actually coming on a Sunday and hallelujahing, far be it from me from pounding the pulpit and, and, and pointing a crooked finger. Far be it from me saying, remember Lot's wife. Okay? But I want to be cautious and careful. Far be it from ever pounding the pulpit and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. But why not? I don't want to err on the side of being angry and, and, and spiteful towards you. But the risk is this, do I, do we, are we teaching and proclaiming cheap grace? Are we up here Sunday after Sunday, week after week in small groups saying, God is love. You do you. You know, in the end, love wins. Everyone's going to go to heaven. It's all good. Just keep the peace. Chase your dreams sunshines and rainbows. But as we look at the scriptures, John 3, 16, yes, for God so loved the world, keep going. But for those who do not believe, they are condemned already. Jesus, he tells a great story. He says the kingdom of heaven is already and not Yet, man, what good news. But there is no good news without bad news. As great, as mighty the good news is, just as devastating is the bad news. God is so loving and so merciful and so gracious, and we can't grasp how great that is until we grasp how devastating our sin is. If we are tempted to wait until later, may we be constant in having a fear of the Lord, not respect the Lord, not put on a clean shirt when you come to church, fear the Lord, but a shaking in your boots, a literal, oh my God, I'm going to die because I'm a sinner, fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We must first fear the Lord, then will we be wise as to how to repent and obey him. Then we can fear not and know his love. Fear God first, then we can fear not. Are you waiting for the garage door to open? To hear that rumble, to see the lightning, to hear the trumpets blare. Then you think, okay, I'm going to drop everything. Then on this day I've determined for myself, I'm going to get serious about my faith. But as we've just seen, as Jesus has described, there is no such thing. When are you going to commit to following him? If you're committing to wait until later, 
Instead, may you see that as a non-commitment, but rather as a commitment of unfaithfulness here and now. Do not wait, do not delay, but be serious about your commitment here and now. Is there a believer who is walking faithfully you can talk to? Someone that you can study the scriptures with, somebody that you can walk with, someone that you can have community with, someone you can journey along together. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I pray the Holy Spirit would convict you of sin and righteousness and that you repent of your sins, believe in him, and obey today. For those of you who have made that commitment and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been coming, attending, other people have been serving and teaching you I encourage you, do not delay in your maturity. As those who have taught and served you, uh, talk with them. Ask them, can you teach me to do what you have been doing? Can I serve alongside you to give back, to serve others, to grow the church? For those who have been serving and teaching, do not delay. Talk with somebody who is walking in their faith. Partner with them. Can I teach you to do what I've been doing? Can we raise up the next generation, the next teachers, the next cares, the next people who are ministering and fellowshipping and leading? What is it in your life that you need to surrender continually? As we grow and mature, God will reveal that more and more in our lives. Maybe we surrender things a year ago, beginning of this year, but let's not think that the work is done, that we've already achieved it, that we've already made it. There's time, resources, energy, dreams, aspirations that you need to let go of so you can know and experience God's kingdom here and now. And as well, let us know God's love, but as well, know that God is just Know that God, his judgment, his wrath is real and imminent. May the fear of the Lord give us wisdom to know how we are to live each and every day. As you are ready and as you reflect upon the cross, come to the table. If you know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, if you are a believer, come take both elements, return to your seat. We'll eat and drink together. Come as you are ready.